Kia ora koutou. Welcome to this uh, further Zui online in the series that are being facilitated by Museums Aotearoa and National Services Te Paerangi. Uh, and thank you to all our participants and the people who are still joining us. Today we're going to talk about visitors, particularly thinking about what has changed since the COVID pandemic. Uh, and perhaps also what's, what's still the same in terms of, of being um, engaged with our audiences who are uh, an important part of what we do in the museum and gallery world. We've got four speakers today and they will each do a little bit of a presentation um, from various different perspectives and we do encourage you to use the chat please for um, any questions and comments you'd like to share. So I'm just going to stop my screen share and we can see a whole lot of people have joined us. So welcome everybody. Um, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Angie Judge from Dexibit, who's going to talk um, about measuring visitors. So thank you, Angie. Thanks so much, Philippa. Can you hear me okay? Cool. See, see images all right? Awesome. And hi everybody, I'm Angie from Dexibit. As a very quick intro, we do big data analytics for visitor attractions. We work with lots of venues in New Zealand, but also um, most of our, our work is focused overseas. And so we work with um, cultural institutions like museums and libraries and galleries through to commercial attractions like theme parks and stadiums. And if you can imagine the last time a visitor walks through your door, all the data that they bring with them, whether that's ticketing or membership um, or digital things that they might be doing on your website or reviews they're leaving on social media, um, even things like their Wi-Fi footprint of their cell phone or what the weather was doing at the time, all of that data is um, great for predicting and analysing visitor behaviour. Um, I thought I would talk about two topics today. One being sort of how do you survive uh, COVID-19 and the second being um, how do you sort of rebuild or thrive on the other side of it um, and both of those from a data perspective. Um, a couple of things from us that we can help with on that front uh, at resources.dexhibit.com and covid.dexhibit.com you'll find lots of white papers and blogs and podcasts and all sorts of things. Um, on navigating uh, the crisis. Um, we did a, a cute video series with all of the visitor attractions we could get to around Auckland, um, the museums included, to talk about their COVID-19 visitor experience and also do some behind the scenes interviews. Um, so great to, um, to see what our, our colleagues in the industry are doing. I know a lot of it is sort of, sort of from level, uh, level three to I'm getting confused about my levels these days. Level two, so a lot of it won't be um, uh, super relevant now, but it's um, been a series that's been really popular internationally. So uh, great to see our New Zealand museums exposed uh, on the, the global stage. And then what I'll talk to today is about a recovery index, about how we can benchmark um, and sort of see where we're performing as a group domestically and how that compares with our colleagues in industry overseas. And I think the big thing with COVID-19, um, there are very few venues in, in the country who um, have consistently hit what they, the numbers that they were doing pre-COVID. Um, sounds like uh, things have been a little bit better in the school holidays for many people and certainly our weekends sometimes look a little bit better than they used to. But overall, we are all down on uh, visitor numbers from what we were doing this time last year or what we would consider to be normal. Um, and so it's hard to know when, when the situation is, um, is that of, is that okay or is that good? Um, you know, it might be less than normal, but is it good for COVID? And so I thought I would talk through a couple of really simple ways to sort of use your numbers off visitation. It's a number that we all have. Um, I know it's not, not the only number to deal with in the data world. There's lots of different quantifiable and qualitative ways of thinking about um, visitors and impact, but it's a nice easy place to start uh, for any museum no matter their size. So when it comes to managing with that metric, the first thing that we would do is um, suggest 
Um, the, the number one metric that's really useful right now for managing recovery is to work out what your percent of normal is, and preferably on a seven day rolling basis. Um, and the reason for this is because you might be doing really well during the weekends, but not so much during the week. If you used to have a lot of tourists during the week and now you're largely dealing with a sort of um, uh, local visitor audience. Um, and so a seven day rolling average sort of pulls out a lot of that um, noise and, and working out what's normal or what's not at the moment. So um, this is a really great number, percent of normal seven day rolling average to use to say, say if things are going well under COVID. That also helps us to add up and say, what is the impact of COVID? So through the shutdown, who we missed out on, if we have another shutdown, and I know that seems really far fetched at the moment, given New Zealand's situation, but it's not a risk that's totally off the table. So um, if that situation does hit us, we need to be able to calculate in advance. So we're going to be closed for six weeks or eight weeks or whatever the case might be, how much that would cost in terms of visitors and therefore um, commercially off the back of that. Um, and these are great figures to have at hand for boards, for government. Um, they're great for lobbying, for requesting funding, for getting donations. Um, and potentially for doing insurance claims if you do have uh, coverage for that. And then the last piece that's a really good number to have at hand is the growth trajectory. And it's particularly in those early days and early weeks of recovery, it's not so useful to say what our week on week growth is because it's great um, when you're starting from five visitors and going to 20 um, and that's not really giving us the whole picture so what's a really useful metric is to go back to our percent of normal and then say on that seven day rolling average how much better is that getting every week or every month and that really helps us to track that recovery so those would be my three three sort of core metrics that i feel are really useful in a post-covid world to that everybody can use no matter how big or small the museum is to really get an idea of how healthy things are given our cir circumstance. And the great thing about these numbers is that they're also comparable because it's hard to measure, well, I've got 1.5 million visitors and I've got 500,000 visitors and I've got 50,000 visitors, but percent of normal and rate of recovery are things that we can benchmark with each other, no matter how big, small the museum is, no matter what region it is. Um, and so this gives us a really good basis for doing benchmarks. Um, we are going to provide a method for, for doing that benchmarking together. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but there is also potentially the opportunity there for um, the Museum's Aotearoa community to form their own benchmark um, on these two numbers in particular um, to be able to pull that data together. And that's a really great opportunity for the industry to use for lobbying and things like that. I know the government's given us a little bit of money so far. It'd be always nice to have some more. So um, these sorts of things can be really great metrics to have, to talk about with the public, to get donations, to get people coming back and supporting their museums um, and to see that support coming in um, uh, at a, a government level as well. And the other one that we might want to think about when we're benchmarking is also for forming little clusters. It's really useful to know if there is, you know, like for me here in Auckland, there is Auckland Maritime Museum and Auckland Museum and MOTAT and lots of the regional galleries and things. And it's great for them to sort of cluster together and be able to compare these numbers. So I think that's a great thing about having a couple of sim uh, simple metrics that are easy for everybody to do that are um, normalized across everyone is that we can start to compare at a domestic level, at a local level, um, in groups like maybe the big museums of, of the country or maybe the art museums of the country, and then to be able to compare ourselves internationally to see how we're doing. And so uh, on the 1st of August, um, we will make a version of this dashboard available. It will be free. Um, and you'll be able to, you can wait list if you want to do that today at the link here, which is join.theexhibit.com. Um, and it, all it requires is daily visitation stats for about the last year. Um, and we can then give you those two numbers. So your, um, your visitation numbers, obviously, that you've provided, your uh, percent of normal, your rate of recovery and your benchmark. 
um, some really useful metrics to manage and then the ability to compare against different local, global and group benchmarks together. Um, so do feel free to um, get that sorted today, um, only a couple of weeks away before that drops. Um, and uh, a really exciting way to be able to start to share things together without having to share data because that's always a little bit scary. So the data of each venue remains private, but the benchmarks are shared together. Um, and just a couple of quick tips that I thought might be useful to, to throw in there. Um, when it comes to um, thinking about how we can start to grow out of, of the situation of COVID-19, um, these are a couple of the main metrics um, improvements that uh, museums globally are focusing on. The first one is taking cost out of their operations. A lot of them are starting to um, evaluate days of the week or times of the day that they're opening or reducing the staff size in terms of the number of people serving uh, visitors if their visitor numbers are depleted. Um, these are um, really important operational decisions for us to consider all the time they are really timely for us to reconsider right now. And even we're seeing like big museums like the Met um, who are cutting several days out of their normal schedule. So I know it can feel like a really dramatic thing to uh, say that we're going to close Monday, Tuesday, um, but the biggest in the world are doing it. So it's not off the table for everyone. Another one to look at is to see where people, how much time is people are spending on site, where they're going on site. Um, uh, especially if you're still dealing with any capacity management or advance pass bookings and um, to think about pricing again um, we're certainly seeing those that are doing 50% flash sales and that sort of thing are getting a lot better performance at those than those that have stayed with their pre-COVID pricing um, so if driving commercial behavior is a um, is a priority for you because that's going to help with financial sustainability and ultimately survival of the organization. These are, are great ones to try. And then lastly, um, uh, and those that, that um, have signed up to our uh, simulator that we put out uh, free during COVID um, and that offer is still open at the moment for those that want to. Um, scenario planning is a really useful thing to be doing at the moment. We're on a good wicket at the moment in New Zealand. Hopefully it stays that way, fingers crossed, um, but it may not. Um, and so planning for rolling shutdowns, planning for tourism to be absent for a very long period of time, planning for recessionary and depression effects in the economy, um, all of these sorts of things, even though we've had a, a good bumper school holidays and even though we've been very lucky so far and very fortunate with our, our country's um, position with COVID, we are still operating in a really risky environment. And so not assuming that um, visitor numbers are going to be there at the rate that they are in the future, um, not making financial decisions that have got really big risk assumptions in them, you know, still play it safe and be conservative. Uh, and you know, simulation, simulation and scenario planning with best, worst and most probable cases at all times provides us with a way to sort of govern that future safely when it is so uncertain. So Philippa, I think that's all I had for today. Um, just a, so that quick look at um, managing through COVID and a couple of tricks to manage out of it. Um, I did want to say a special congratulations to Motat um, and to Papa. Um, both have won American Alliance Awards, which I think is very cool that we've got two New Zealand museums in, um, in the American Awards uh, and um, yeah, really excited uh, that they have won gold for their uh, trams and tech project. So uh, a shout out to the team. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yes, and that, that was great to see Motat and, and Te Papa being recognised internationally. Um, I was very interested, you were talking about some of the, the um, changing behaviour, that hyper-local uh, visitation. Um, I've been hearing that through my tourism contacts as well. The hospitality people, for instance, were reporting that um, the, the restaurants and bars in central Nelson are pretty flat, but over the, over the way in Richmond, they're packed out with locals. So this, this is a quite a different um, set of visitor behaviour. And people are, are, are saying that in some parts of the country, their visitation is up, particularly over the school holidays. And there has been a certain amount of that kind of pent up um, uh, 
exploration of different experiences by people who, who are getting out to see New Zealand. But how much is that going to continue? We, mm. we don't know. It's Which, funny, um, overseas we're not seeing that level of pent-up demand and New Zealand's recovery on the international scale is doing really well. Um, so hopefully, long may that continue. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting message that all the assumptions and all the metrics that we used to hold fairly certain, like average revenue per visit, the days of the week that we're busy, the times of the day, the amount of time visitors spend on site, they're all off the table. And so paying attention to those numbers again, going back to those big assumptions that we make in terms of planning is just so important right now. Yes, absolutely, which is a good time to hand over to Gail, Gail Beck from Te Papa, who's um, Head of uh, Audience Insights there. And you've been doing some work on forecasting and on the shape of the, of the vis new visitation since the lockdown. So over yeah. to you, Gail. That's right, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Can everybody see that? Yeah, okay, cool. So um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Gail Beck. Um, I work at Tapapa. I'm actually currently acting head of programming um, at the moment, but I'm normally head of audience insights. Um, I've got three kids, a dog, and somebody started banging next door and I'm working from home. So I hope that there's gonna be no disturbances. Um, but what I wanted to um, talk to you about today was um, our physical visitation since reopening, um, and by physical visitation I mean visits to the museum. Um, forecasting uh, physical visitation for the next financial year, and just some thoughts that we've got on um, how we're going to move forward. So um, to begin, um, to Papa has been uh, very lucky. Physical visitation has returned faster than we um, anticipated. So the purple line here shows actual visits in the first three weeks since reopening and green are the forecasts and those forecasts are actually from Dexhibit. We were really lucky enough to have access to that tool, um, which is fabulous. Um, so you can see here the gap between the actual and the forecast closing, um, particularly at weekends, those arrows are shortening. Um, so one thing to note here, and it picks up on what Angie was saying, weekday visitation is still lagging. Um, and this might be because people or commuters are staying home and out of the city still. Um, and it's also probably a lesson for us in terms of visitation. Um, the, off, um, the off holidays, weekday visitation is buoyed by those international visitors and not by the locals. And that wasn't something that um, I had considered when I was putting together these um, forecasts. Um, this is another way that we can look at physical visitation and it's um, week, um, it's looking at the weeks over the past five weeks. So the week one's missing because it wasn't a full week. Um, the actual visits are in purple again. And here our benchmark is last year's domestic visitation. So our assumption was that um, uh, comparing to last year's domestic um, would be a good bet because we were expecting predominantly domestics coming through. So again, here you can see the gap closing between actual and our benchmark. And in fact, in the last weeks at the end of June, um, physical visitation was on par with last year's domestic visitation. So that's not total visitation, that's just our domestic, but still way beyond our expectations so soon after reopening. Um, and that's partly what we we're saying, it's the, um, the rally um, that New Zealanders have taken up the call to go out and enjoy their own country. Um, uh, and the great news that Queenstown is another example of somewhere that's humming is, a, is testament to that. Um, but it's also due to a surprise, which I'm going to show you um, next. Um, and that was, and it suggests that perhaps comparing, having our benchmark as domestic wasn't um, necessarily the best choice. So moving on to that slide, this is looking at um, the visitors in June this year and June last year and where they normally live. Um, and in that um, top blue box, you can see that actually a quarter of our visits were from um, international. So that's much stronger than we had anticipated. Um, and we were initially a bit concerned. It's actually been consistent. We had a different survey that we were using on reopening and then we went back to our actual exit survey. We were concerned that our question wasn't working properly, but actually talking to the hosts who work front of house, it wasn't a surprise to them because there were still quite a lot of people that were um, long-time travellers or people that were trapped in the country after lockdown that actually 
were some of the first to come back because they really wanted to experience a piece of New Zealand. Um, the other great news from this is that um, rest of New Zealanders, so the darker blue colour, um, that um, they're showing, showing strong visitation as well. And again, um, this comes down to what we've seen um, and what, we would, what was being mentioned before, that people are taking advantage of this opportunity to enjoy their own country. And it's really great to see such a strong proportion. So why have people decided to come back to Te Papa? And this data comes from the, um, the exit survey, the quick exit survey that we asked um, uh, in level two. And it was a quick pop-up that they got through a QR code on their phone. Um, and these are the four main reasons. So um, the first one being that it, Te Papa is a part of locals' lives and people actually missed it. So the first opportunity they had, they came back to feel um, at home again. Um, Secondly, um, as a, a classic answer, it's just a great space to spend time with friends and family and it's a really good safe option. Um, number three was a, um, a bit of a surprise. It's something that we don't often consider because we think about the learning that the museum has to offer. But there's also that kind of community space, um, particularly the cafes is an opportunity for people to relax or escape home. So people weren't coming necessarily to visit the, the museum, but they were coming to get out of home into a safe open space. And then fourth, it's just a must-see um, Wellington attraction. So it's lucky that Te Papa holds that, that strong position and encourages such strong visitation. And in that same exit survey, we also um, asked people what we could do, um, what we could have done better. So I thought I'd quickly cover this just in case we do ever go back into lockdown in terms of how people were thinking and feeling immediately post. Um, and actually it was really good news. And I think none of us were sure what people would think or feel about being back in a space where they felt so close to people. But on the whole, the feedback um, in terms of our safety and distancing measures were really positive. So over 90% of people saying that accessibility, wayfinding, health and safety measures were well implemented, people felt safe. 74% of people said they'd be comfortable using hands-on interactives. And those actually weren't open until level one, I think. And that was another reason why we didn't have our standard exit survey. Um, but then you have got this smaller, but I guess potentially quite strong group of people. So 13% of people who didn't feel like they were able to maintain social distancing in the building. And 10% of people who didn't feel um, that they would be comfortable using the hands-on interactives. So although New Zealanders felt, uh, it seemed like they felt ready to get back into normal life, there was still that small group that weren't. Then moving on to forecasting, and um, gosh, this is a hard one. Um, I was actually a little relieved to be able to pass it over to our new acting head of audience insights to do rather than myself. Um, so that's Samueli de Stefani, and he's done the, this piece of work. Um, but he did a really thorough review of the reports and data available um, to predict return of domestic and, and internationals. And his conclusions were, um, it's actually a really difficult thing to do, um, but the current scenarios are changing at such a rapid pace that this, what you predict one week actually changes the next week. Um, and that there's other curveballs coming in. So the impact of the recession for some, is something that it's going to be hard to predict. And I think also actually based on that previous conversation, there is definitely um, the feel of a rally call going out for New Zealanders going in and enjoying the country now. But will that last, um, particularly if we feel financially stretched? Um, some things were certain. certain. Tourism is one of the hardest hit sectors in New Zealand and also likely to be one of the longest hit. Um, we do expect domestic to return to pre-COVID levels and um, potentially in a short period space of time. Um, and international return will depend on border restrictions. Um, and all of the above rely on there being no more outbreaks and lockdowns. So no kind of new news probably there for you, but I'll just move on and show you um, what we have done for forecasting. So this is um, how we've forecasted our, our figures for the next financial year. And we've actually, um, we've looked back at the past two years and taken an average um, by months of those years and then applied um, kind of a maximum and a minimum using these figures. Um, so we've said, for example, for the first quarter, we expect between 60 and 100% of domestics to return. Um, and then nothing from international. Now the change here is that when we first did this, we actually thought we might see a bit of um, Australia coming through here, um, but we've decided that um, it's probably a bit 
less likely to happen in September now. Um, and then you would do this, we have done the same for the second quarter. So here we're expecting domestic visitation to have um, potentially over recovered and then potentially a bit coming through from Australia. So that's, this is the format that we've been using. Um, and as I say, we've already had to update our figures based on new information that we've had. Um, and then these three horizons as well, this is based on the view that's being used internally in terms of how we are talking about the next um, financial year. So um, that's why it's been written in those horizons. Um, I hope that's clear, but if anyone else wants some more information on that, then I'm more than happy to talk about that another time. Um, so just sorry. No, sorry. Okay. Sorry. He just got a, um, a Chromebook. Um, so moving on, um, has um, COVID um, changed us? Um, and the answer is yes. And I wanted to catch on and um, touch on this really quickly because it, I think it will be a good lead into Sabine. Um, I quickly saw her manifesto yesterday and it was like she'd been a fly on the wall in some of the conversations that we've been having, um, particularly me and Adrian actually, who's also presenting to you. But it's massively changed our thinking um, in terms of thinking beyond the physical museum and considering um, other options, so for example, digital. So flipping from being exhibition first to being more of a holistic programme, um, really committing to delivering to priority audiences. It's such a great opportunity um, now that we are expecting more predominantly domestic to really focus on Maori and Pacific audiences, for, um, for example, um, involving communities in authentic um, engagement. Um, being guided by societal trends and ongoing conversations. So it's been a real time for us to stop, reflect and think how we want to move on and how we want to do things differently. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Gail. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and again, it ties in with some of the information that we've been receiving from uh, the tourism sector is that they're not really expecting that uh, the international tourism will return possibly until March or even later, 2021. Um, but I'm just interested, have you done any thinking about how different that, that uh, what the effect of that difference and that, that emphasis on domestic tourism is in that domestic tourists have different expectations from international visitors. Um, for instance, there's a, a commonly held assumption that Kiwis don't want to spend as much as international tourists. Um, yeah, so we know that um, domestic, um, and domestic it meet, depends also where they're from. So locals have a very different visit experience to um, people that are visiting for, from Auckland, for example, or people from the region, because we know if they're coming from further, they are more likely to spend in the museum. Um, we, I think a lot of it is just, um, we're developing our thinking and are developing our programming still around that. So um, we'd be happy to share more once we've, we've done more thinking. Thank you, Gail. Yes, it's, as you said, it's a, it's a constantly moving target. Mm. Yeah. And, and um, it is interesting that you had all those international visitors still coming through because there are, and, and I was trying to find the, the figures, but something like 300,000 international visitors still in New Zealand for various yeah. reasons, um, because they got stuck here because they don't want to go home or can't go home. Yeah, and desperate for things to do um, and an opportunity to learn about New Zealand. Absolutely, which is, which is you know, another um, way that we can act actually add value as the museum sector while those people are here. Yeah. Um, tourism um, people are very focused on maintaining New Zealand's reputation as an international destination in the international market for when the borders do open again, um, because they see us as a, as a premier destination um, and they don't want us to be forgotten. Um, so this is another another opportunity for us to maintain that brand awareness and, and um, good reputation that New Zealand has as a great place to visit. Yeah, and another reason to invest in digital, um, as Adrian, who's coming later, can tell you that um, we might design for our domestic market, but actually the digital stuff that we do is still really popular amongst the internationals as well. 
Absolutely, and that's a way to continue that reach um, without the physical visitation. Mm -hmm. in, um, when you're thinking about that, and you're thinking about that audience, if you're if you're designing something for multiple audiences, then that's a, a challenge. So I think it's probably a good time to hand over to Sabine mm -hmm. to think about the audience focus. So mm -hmm. over to you, Sabine. Hello, thanks, Philippa, uh, and in our Koto Katoa. Hello, everyone. Call Sabine Doolin Ahau. Um, I'm Sabine Doolin. I run a boutique consultancy called Insights Unlocked, and I work with cultural organizations on yeah, audience focus and more strategic approach um, to developing audiences. And thanks very much, Angie and Gail. That was really great to see, and see how people are returning after those crazy weeks and I salute you all in arts organizations for going through all of that and closing opening different safety measures and also for pushing all that amazing content out um, into the digital world that was really great and I think helped people through lockdown and kept organizations really top of mind and I think hopefully let's let some, some new audiences as well um, and I think where I'm coming from now is kind of saying after all these crazy weeks where we all focused very much on operations um, to maybe go back looking at data and taking a little bit more of a strategic view and how we develop our audiences. Um, and you read every very thing that people say, oh, don't go back to normal, go and create a new normal. <laughs> so I was kind of thinking about what, what does that mean? What could a new normal be? Um, and what I would suggest is that it is a stronger audience focus or that we use this time now also to kind of look a little bit at the approaches we take and how we work around audiences, how we work internally, um, where visitors feature in our strategies, but also in our processes, um, what meetings we have, which departments are involved in planning for visitors and so on. Um, and my starting point is, um, I always kind of say, my idea is develop your audience, but don't be for everyone. Um, and it might sound a bit counterintuitive to develop something by not being for everyone. Um, but I think it just means we all have limited resources um, now even more so than usual um, and it just means we need to be really laser sharp with our strategy and spend it on the right things. Um, so I've spent lockdown writing a manifesto, <laughs> I call it a manifesto for audience focus, um, to offer some thoughts on how we could become more audience focused and it's you know great to hear what others think. I'm very open to any additions to it um, and what you think um, is important. It's based on my experience working as a consultant in with organizations in New Zealand. I've previously worked in uh, for Tate in the UK and I've worked in branded consumer goods in the commercial world for a long time. So all of this is kind of melting together in my head. Um, I've done recently some reading um, and did a um, qualification as a design thinking facilitator and I think design thinking has a lot to offer for the cultural sector. So I'm quite keen to explore um, that more. Um, so I'd like to share my screen and just run through the manifesto quite quickly, but I'll also put a link into the chat so for people to kind of look at it maybe with a little bit more leisure um, than I can do now in the few minutes we have here. So my first point, um, you are not your audience, uh, meaning we are all spoiled because we've spent too much time in the sector. So always good to go out and listen to audiences and looking at data and we've just seen um, data that has been shared and if organizations are not able to do their own audience research I said there's so much available in the sector that we can use um, um, it's just really a matter of you know grasping it um, and doing something um, so people often ask me also you won't get a useful answer to the question what do you want to an audience and that's very much but can it's more about understanding people's context how they live what they do why they visit and so on and then coming up with ideas on what we think they might want based on that insight and then putting them back to them for comment. Um, as I said, don't be for everyone, meaning select the people you want to make a special effort for. Of course we want to be welcoming to anybody who you know turns up at our organizations, um, but there might be some groups that we really want to make a special effort for and being very clear about those because we can't do everything. Um, so we might have to prioritize and sometimes people are a bit nervous that that might exclude somebody But I think it's really not about you know not being welcoming, but it's really about making a special focus and looking back at our purpose um, Or the purpose of your organization that can be your filter in helping you set those priorities as much as your audience insight can help you guide that 
and then articulating those intentions, writing that up and communicating that to the whole organization. That is your audience strategy, the groups you want to um, prioritize and what you want to do for them. So it's really about communicating that strategy, democratizing your insight, sharing your data widely in the organization, helping those people that might not enjoy reading graphs and charts so much um, in doing it in some other ways and actually really using it and championing audiences, especially um, leaders of organizations to really show how much value they put on audiences by championing them. Maybe you, you know, put your audience hat on in a meeting or you, know, you might even invite some representatives of audiences to meetings sometimes just to create more of that awareness and also showing how important it is to an organization. Then I would say kind of start thinking audiences when you start planning um, and not so sometimes it happens towards the end of a project and things can't really be changed people are very precious then about the project time is running out and so on so it's really starting to think about it from the beginning and making audience development part of your core work um, rather than having one of projects for specific audiences oh we're doing you know some one project for a specific group thinking more continuously about how that is part of your core work and how you building and delivering something for that audience um, throughout the year. And then also being quite clear what success looks like um, and what impact you want to have. And I think we'll hear more from Adrian about impact. Um, but if the whole organization is clear what impact you're trying to achieve and what success really looks like, that just makes it so much easier to rally around and also making kind of everybody accountable because we all in organizations everybody touches on the experience of the audience uh, one way or another so all feeling responsible for that rather than just saying oh this is kind of what marketing does or this is what um, education does or certain departments um, that seem kind of closer to that but it's really everybody impacting um, meaning to foster a culture of collaboration internally importantly kind of joining up the silos that so often exists exist mainly in large organizations, but sometimes also in smaller ones, um, but also collaboration with audiences, seeing them really as partners um, and not just as customers or so, um, and collaboration with other organizations. I mean, it's great what Angie presented, you know, benchmarking, sharing data or partnering up in activities for certain audiences. Um, I like to say that it's not our biggest competition is not the arts organization down the road. Um, but it's Netflix or it's the sofa or it's kind of lots of other things we can do and our audiences can do with their time. And as a being welcoming to everybody and being welcoming, especially for those people that might not be like us, that don't know the sector so well, that might be more outsiders to your organization because it's the first time they're coming or it's not what they're doing all the time, kind of just helping them along to enjoy their visit and being a bit conscious what our own biases might be and whose viewpoints or needs we might be ignoring. Um, and then one, I think I've heard it many times during lockdown that a lot of organizations put a lot of priority on staff, which was really great. Um, and I think visitor facing organizations, staff is so important and staff often, if we um, look at data, it shows us that our audiences have great memories and great experience when they had interaction with staff. So the way we treat our staff is the way we want them to treat our audiences. This is where the organization culture comes across um, in the brand. And then lastly, experiment. Um, if we understand our audience better, we can come up with ideas. You know, you're working all from your own organizations. You can change things, put things on the wall, show things um, to customers, to audiences, get their ideas and build your innovation really on your insight. Um, see what they think about it and try new things based on a deep knowledge of all this. So that's my number 23. I ended up with 23 for whatever reason <laughs> um, from my manifesto. As I said, I'll put the link in the, in the chat um, so you can read the whole thing, which has a few more comments. And if anybody has any ideas on things that should be added or wants to discuss anything, I'm, I'm very happy to have that, um, that conversation or, you know, add an amend. Um, I just like it to be a living thing and hopefully make people think a little bit and, and how we work and what we do around audiences. Thanks very much, Kiora, everyone. Thank you, Sabine. Um, those are all things which, which kind of we intuitively know, but it's really great to be absolutely reminded and to go through them in, in, a, in a logical sequence. Um, and it's a very good 
introduction to Adrian, who I'm going to hand over to because I know he has limited time. Um, so just to move on from understanding and working with your audiences to thinking more about that impact, over to you, Adrian. Uh, thanks, Philippa. So yeah, I'm Adrian Kingston. I am um, Digital Channels Manager here at Papa. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is actually something that's not COVID related, but probably, I guess, has um, has uh, risen in, in um, needed visibility as a result. It's actually something that we've been working on for about three years, and I'm just going to share the screen. Um, many of you have heard this before, um, and I am also going pretty quick, but I'll go through it really quickly and then we will see if there's any questions or anything like that. There's, I've given Philippa a link to um, uh, much more information around it. He said, look, I'm going to the presentation. Okay, so I'll just keep going. Um, as I say, this is something that's been going around for about three years. We've, um, we're slowly implementing it more and more here at the Papa. We did a sort of semi-formal evaluation of it um, as part of our um, government expectations um, this year and it's come out pretty good. Okay, so anyway, so um, we have talked a lot about numbers uh, today and numbers are a pretty key thing as in terms of understanding um, how we recover but as has always also been touched on um, it's only one of the things that we need to actually worry about so I mean we could probably get more people back into to Papa by doing completely different things that had no impact, but of course we're not going to do that. Um, so what we actually want to understand better is, is what is the value of what, what we offer and what is the impact of what we do for our audiences and how do we measure audience success rather than um, just business success. So an attempt to move away from vanity metrics, um, which is a, a term that's used a lot um, in uh, internet measurements, um, so where Page views have been traditionally used as an indicator, but um, are often meaningless. Um, but also things like feet through the door or um, dollars earned or satisfaction ratings, they're still important um, and we still need to track all of those kinds of things, but they're only part of the picture of whether we're succeeding for our audiences or not. So we came up with a five step model um, that was, after doing a bunch of research, looking around for different models, um, none of, there's a few out there, but none of them quite fit for the glam sector. Um, and what the model that we've come up with does is it allows you to combine qualitative and quantitative uh, metrics at the same time and it provides a structure for storytelling alongside um, the, the standard metrics. And the storytelling is in our uh, audience's voice, not in ours. We're not even doing the interpretation, it's direct from our audiences. Um, it was originally designed for digital experiences, but it turned out very quickly that it could be used for anything audience facing. And it's a really good way on focusing in on, as Sabine said, um, your priority audiences and actually designing specifically for them. Um, but not only the audiences that we have in the kind of a traditional fashion, but the, the model can also be used for uh, designing for a measuring impact on communities that you're working with or co-creating with, um, on artists if you're doing that kind of work, with iwi if you're working with them, um, because it's flexible enough to be able to do that sort of thing. So what we came up with was um, at the top level, attention, reaction, connection, insight, and action. Attention is, is the, the, usual, um, the usual metrics. How many people have you got? How many people have you got coming through the door? That sort of thing. Reaction is, is the idea of, um, you know, traditionally we might just do that as, as satisfaction or task completion, um, but there's a lot more to it. And then if we actually um, drill down a bit more, um, we can see that there are, oh sorry, I, I will go back, there are, there are the five main things. So reaction is, is yeah, how are they reacting? Uh, are reacting. Connection is, um, what connection do you have between the experience and the audience? Insight is around learning, and action is actually uh, the audience going away and doing something as a result of the experience that you've had. Um, this is the way that we, we uh, sort of describe it at a really high level. So as I said, um, Attention court level one is how many people are going to walk in and uh, see the experience, click on something. That is the base of the measurements. You kind of need that. And that, again, that's why numbers are, are really important because if you, the higher you are in there, the more chance you have of moving people further down the spectrum. 
um, immediate response is uh, what kind of response are they having in terms of joy, fear, or emotional, but also how many people are going to be indifferent? Um, and is that okay? Because you're not going to get everybody moving through. But one of the things around this is, is you'll see, you'll, you'll hear me talk about a spectrum a lot and you'll see lots of visual cues to it. Um, you're not going to move everybody all the way through down to national impact. That's not going to happen. Um, so it's designing to understand how many people you can move through each step. Um, personal connection, we know that personal connection is, is a really important um, precursor to learning, um, which is why you'll see it uh, in, as level three. How many people are actually going to have a personal connection to the experience? And this is obviously really key to designing for target audiences as well. But it's also setting people up for more success. Uh, level four is simple learning. What's a really simple thing that they might walk away from the experience with? Learning uh, the fact that the, the two versions of the treaty are actually quite different. Um, just something small like that isn't going to, you know, be massively life-changing, but we know that we're actually quite good at that um, as, as in, within the GLAM sector. Applied personal learning is slightly more complicated. It's what can they actually take from the experience that they can apply in a small way to their own lives? Um, so things like that might be just thinking about um, how they uh, recycle slightly differently or something along those lines, or just how they talk to people. Actually, you know, so applied empathic learning is how can they take that learning and apply it to how they think about or deal with others um, or how they might um, consider other people's perspectives and actually apply it the way that they um, in their own lives in a very small way. So rather than immediately recoiling to um, facial tattoo, they might think slightly different, different about the meaning of, of the tattoo that the person that they're looking at might have. They might have slightly different conversations at work um, around particular subjects. Personal action is the kind of thing where they actually go away and do something new, um, a new piece of creativity, some new research, um, something that they might not have done as a result if they hadn't come and, and, and been part of your experience. Group or community impact is, is uh, something that actually obviously creates um, uh, impact on a wider, um, more than just one person. Um, and things in that area are things like um, creating new uh, learning resources, um, setting up a project in your neighbourhood to uh, deal with that local stream, all those sorts of things. And then national impact is there possibly specifically for Te Papa and, and, and other national organisations because we are a national organisation. There should be potential for us to actually create national impact through what we do. So things in there could be like um, policy affected at, at government level um, through our research or through um, our audience's voice. It could be things like generating um, economic return for New Zealand, which we've got a couple of examples of um, fashion designers turning our collections into um, high fashion and selling it overseas. So uh, making a higher profile for some of our money coming. So that's really quickly what it kind of looks like. Um, there's a whole lot of steps. There's much more description on the, in the link that um, Philippa will share. Um, we kind of step through how it works and we say what is and, and doesn't apply for those these kinds of things. The risk with the, the, a model like this is it's really easy to um, overestimate the impact that you can have. But it's, it's also a really good design tool because it means that you can back, um, bounce backwards and forwards um, in your ambitions. And if you're using it throughout the design and um, evaluation process, you, you get better and better at it as well. And you'll make decisions that actually uh, either change your targets or change your product design uh, as you figure these things out and test them. Um, so yeah, everything is based on visitor success rather than to Papa success. Up until we had this, usually we only ever talked about to Papa success. Um, it is difficult to reach the higher levels, but it, and it does require a new way of thinking, but it asks, um, how far can you go when you're designing something? And it, and it gives a common design tool across experiences that lets you understand the types of things that you can do to move um, a visitor through this spectrum. Um, it makes it really, so one of the things that's really good, and, and there's a slide that comes up, is we know that not all of our experiences are going to get maybe past level four. Some will get to um, six or seven. Occasionally we'll get to nine, but the different levels of effort and the different levels of um, uh, complexity for the audience is really important to make sure that there's a good spread of that. Um, and it lets you understand how far you want to push as an organization, particularly if you tie it to your strategy, not just for individual products. So whilst you 
probably apply this process and, and the spectrum to individual products, you can actually look at it from an organizational view um, and see what products are, are reaching what audiences and, and how many and, and to what level of impact. Um, this is where we're starting to head to its pup and now. We've, we've gotten reasonably good at figuring out how individual products work. Um, now we're trying to step higher up and look at how these kinds of things meet um, organizational needs uh, against our strategies and our, our priority audiences. Um, I've already touched on the fact that it, it really, it's a, it's a model that you don't just set up at the beginning and then put away in the cupboard along with a lot of your other project initiation um, papers, but actually it's something that you should use from the very beginning as a design tool, a prioritization tool, um, and testing as you develop. Um, the, we've had a couple of ex, uh, ex, exhibition design experiences here where we have made We've been about halfway through an experience, um, halfway through the design of a particular exhibition and realized that we weren't meeting a particular criteria or target that we were after. And to change the, not significantly, but to actually meet that need. Um, and we have found that it does do that, that the audiences are having the level of empathy that we were um, interested in. And it should be used as uh, obviously a post-launch success measurement, but also as a continuous improvement tool over the life of an experience. Um, you know, often we're guilty of doing some evaluation and just after launch and then not con continuously evaluating. Um, how do you know that, that you're continuing to have the impact that you have after an exhibition, a long-term exhibition has been open for a year or a website has been up for three years? Because our audiences have moved on, but the experience hasn't necessarily. So you need to be able to actually quantify some of that. Um, and of course, you should be using it as a communication tool and, a, and as a future planning tool. Um, whenever I talk about this model, I always get questions about um, the fact that um, uh, personal action, group or community action and national impact often come well after the visit. Uh, it's not something that happens while you actually have your audience's attention. It might be something that happens in the week or the, the month or, or even a year after when we're talking about things like people changing careers um, or finally getting around to doing that, that art project that was um, informed or, or those sorts of things. So um, a classic example that we have is we currently have an a exhibition on, on um, Samoan tattooing, so tatau. And one of the measures of success we wanted to design for and understand was um, are there people who were going to get a um, culturally appropriating tattoo who now are getting something that is more meaningful to them um, and isn't so much based in appropriation? Or have we um, now encouraged um, someone who it is appropriate for to have that tattoo to actually um, step over the line and walk into a tattoo store and say, look, I, I actually really want this. And so we're not gonna know that as they leave the exhibition. Um, particularly, we're not going to know that if they do that. So one of the things that we're thinking about doing is doing a survey of tattoo studios um, and the tattoo network um, in the coming months to see if any of the artists have actually heard of anybody come mentioning the exhibition um, and in relation to the, to the work that they're getting done. But we've, there's lots of other ways that we can do that um, using our channels um, because, as I said, once we lose contact with the, um, with the audience, it can be quite hard to get touch base with them again but we have really strong networks so that they are part of as well. So community networks, education networks, all of those sorts of things. And we need to be using them more for that, um, that real post-visit um, evaluation. There's lots of other things that we can do as well. Um, but a lot of it is about gathering more data more regularly and making sure that evaluation is, is a real key um, part of what we do, but really focusing on talking to real people and getting stories. Uh, and that's it. That's the fastest introduction I've ever done to it. Sorry, I've only got four minutes before I need to leave. Um, happy for any questions in the meantime, though. Thank you, Adrian. That's, that's a really good summation. And it does really reinforce that we need to know our audiences and we need to have ways of communicating with them and seeking their input into, um, into right at the beginning of the planning of programming through to after they've been um, and engaged with us. So Angie talked about, about the kind of the, the big data and the analytics. Um, and Gail, you were talking more about 
what you can do on the ground and, and using the tool that, um, that Adrian has as a kind of a framework, but then talking to your visitors. Um, I wonder, Gail, if you've got any thoughts on how to actually get some immediate feedback from your audience so that you can um, really understand and start being more audience focused. Is it through um, the exit surveys? Is it through post-it notes? What, what sort of mechanisms do you use? Um, we use quite a lot of mechanisms now, actually. We have our standard exit survey um, that's been running for 20 years, um, but that's very much focused on collecting demographics and feedback. Um, we use the 15 um, dimensions of visitor experience, which was developed by the University of Queensland, um, Jan Packer. And that's actually fascinating to see the emotional um, experiences that an exhibition delivers. Um, and the idea being that you'd have a mixture throughout because not everything has to be reverential, hard hitting. Some things can be just enjoyable. Um, we um, do exhibition exit surveys, which might be just online, um, but we also do more qualitative work. So in the exhibition that Adrian was mentioning, Tatao, um, we kind of delved into the emotional experience that people had throughout that exhibition because it, there was quite a lot of um, fascinating feelings that people had. Um, uh, one that I remember was, was about the that thing between kind of the pain and the pleasure of seeing the tattoo and the sound of the tattoo when it's being made. So it was quite interesting picking up on those things. Um, and then I think the, something that we want to do at more and more is just go out and talk to them in general um, about our exhibition ideas before they're on the floor um, and kind of involve the audience more from that perspective. So more kind of lean and light. Thank you. Um, Sabine, I just I wonder if you've got some thoughts on perhaps really um, simple ways that perhaps smaller organisations can, can get that audience focus uh, into their thinking a bit more. I was looking around the people who are, um, who are there on this hui. There, there are people from a range of different sizes of organisations, some quite small. Mm. I think on a one-on-one -on -one is that there, I find there's a lot of data available in the sector and studies available that we can use and, you know, organizations like, you know, AMG and Dexibit is very generous and, you know, MHM and, you know, all the usual suspects do offer a lot. You do your um, survey if your museums out here. So I think there's a lot that we can use if you can't do your own, but then there's also something for doing qualitative um, research and just talking to people, you know, we're in organizations, people are there every day. You can just grab them on the floor um, and show them something or, you know, get reactions, test things out and so on. And just really, um, just talking to people, you always need to, you know, get a bit organized and how you ask them and so on, but you know, you can easily learn that um, and, and get their feedback or invite them in. If it's a little bit longer, invite them in for, you know, for a focus group or a discussion round and so on and get that live voice into your head, kind of, you know, what people think and how they go about it. Thank you. Yes, I've heard that Open Art Gallery um, regularly asks their gallery assistants for that feedback um, and, and really records that and takes it back to the planning team. Um, just thinking, Angie, have you got some thoughts on how you kind of combine that qualitative um, insight with the big data and the big numbers that you're getting through the, you know, following people through the gallery and that sort of uh, approach? Yeah, sure. I think um, one of the interesting things about um, qualitative data is that it can be quantitative. Um, so it is possible, and um, I think the, the funnel Adrian showed sort of starts to tap into that to, um, you know, either manually code it if you're dealing with a small number of data pieces or um, use sentiment analysis technology if you're dealing with really big um, sets of data to say what emotions it represents, you know, using the um, five or six standard emotions, um, what topics or themes it represents, what keywords you see in it. Um, and so that sort of means that you can start to um, like he was saying, continuously improve and monitor metrics over time and try and experiment new things and see if they move the needle for you. 
Um, uh, for anybody who's starting out, Net Promoter Score is a nice way to start for measuring satisfaction. It's a global and not, not industry specific, but global um, uh, standard for measuring satisfaction, which is that question of out of 10, how much would you recommend that to a friend? Um, so having that combination of um, what people were saying and listening um, to Voice of the Visitor com combined with sort of quantitative measures, either from that voice or otherwise, and then the last piece of the puzzle is then mixing that with behaviour, because often what people say is different to what they do. Um, and that's where things like, you know, the, the Wi-Fi piece for dwell times and repeat rates, or looking at has our membership conversion been going up or are we churning members? Um, you know, are we seeing over forecast uh, performance during predictable times that we can attribute to marketing campaigns or exhibitions? Um, how does this exhibition compare performance-wise to another, um, and does that sort of say something about the resonance of that to, to, the, um, to the community? Those sorts of things, it gives us a holistic picture once we start um, going down that path. Thank you. Now we have run out of time. Uh, it's been a really interesting discussion, and I I've, think there are some particular uh, takeaways that I hope everybody is going to be able to, to um, build on. And it's, it, there's, a, a lot of you have talked about being really intentional, really thinking about the audience uh, and focusing on the audience, considering what the